Okay, let's do a little bit of Tzav and against Ariel's wishes. Let's do something on Purim while we're doing no, no, it. No, it's time, it's time. It is time. Um, no, this is a... Um, I was, I was having a back and forth a little bit with this with, uh, with Ray Foreman yesterday, so it's on my mind anyways. Um, there are a series of Midrashic traditions that seem to point us in the direction, which, to be fair, emerges somewhat from Shad, but um, the Midrashic traditions highlight it, that part of the problem that we have with, uh, with Akashverosh is that he was replacing God. <laughs> right, they use something to replace God. Right? We have a lot of minhagim, by the way. Yeah, right, we have a lot of minhagim that point in this I direction. <laughs> right now, by the way, and there, and that his house was the sort of subversion of the mikdash. Right, the most famous of the midrashim that points in that direction is he's using the the they're using the kalim. Right, they were using the kalim and the mikdash, which is anachronistic. Right, because I'll peep shat hadvarim based on what we know of history. Why is that problematic? Because they were already... Thinking. Yeah, because the Jews were already rebuilding the Beit HaMikdash at that time, right? And Cyrus had sent them, right? So... Hmm. What? So, so it, Al Pshad, no. Al Pshad, Cyrus had already sent them, and the problem is that this is a very diasporic work, right? Where the, this whole problem is happening specifically to the people who did not return to Eretz Israel. Which complicates the entire story, which is why sort of a lot of the modern reads, especially in Israel, of Megad Esther, are like, huh, this is a critique of those people who are, you know, um, um, yeah. Anyways, um, now there are other ones, obviously, that point to this uh, this com- connection between Achashverosh trying to replace himself as uh, as God, and therefore his house is replacing the Mishkan, right, the subversion. I don't remember who pointed this out. It was one of the shirim I was listening to a few weeks ago in, um, maybe it was right, Clapper pointed it out to me. But um, why is it that t- that we refer to God and this, as Melech Malchei Hamlachim? Because he's the king of the king of kings. Yeah, what the heck does the king of the king of kings mean? Oh, the king of kings. Oh. The emperor, uh, king of king, Mal- Malcheyam Lachim means emperor. Hmm. And in the age of empires, the king, right, Achashverosh was the king of kings. Yes, because he's the because he's the emperor, not the king, right? He's the king over 127 million, you know, which might have their own independent rulers, but he's the emperor. Until 1979. And therefore, Melech Malcheyam Lachim. What? No, but descriptively, right? Malchei Hamlachim, right? Meaning, if you have an empire, then the emperor is the Malchei Hamlachim, which means that if God wants to describe himself as above them, he has to be the emperor, the emperor of emperors, right? That would be a more right, right? now. And it's clear, therefore, that the fact that God never appears, right? Bachashverosh does every time that he's supposed to, right? Obviously, the lack. I mean, this is you know there are many vorts in the the Megillah, but one of them is that. The reason God's name is not there, besides for it being a very, you know, sort of nasal der chateva, is also the fact that the whole atmosphere of Persia, right, makes it that God is invisible. And now, certain of our minhagim are meant to draw attention to this, like Hamelech, you know, where we in right in the middle of Megillah and Perak Vav, we invoke. Right? Rosh Hashanah tune, talking about God for Achashverosh, right? Just to, right? Because it's, Balailahi Nadidash Nat Hamelech, right? And we, literally it means Achashverosh, but really it means that God has started to, right, shake things up in the, in the story. But, um, the point is, right, that the Midrash, the Midrash really does point you in this direction that part of the problem of the culture of Shushan and the and the Jews' involvement in it is that um, the atmosphere of that empire, which deified the king, right to the exclusion of all else. Um, again, whether or not it was in the in the way that Paro does it, where he actually called himself a god, or just in the way we sort of drastically talk about it in the 20th century 20th, 21st century right that anything that has taken over people's lives is the, lives is the new of Zara, yeah. right I mean at some level that's true yeah. right meaning in the sense that yes if you have a king who makes the entire world revolve around him then um, there's a Tom of Avodah what there's yeah there's a Tom of Avodah and if you look through the Megillah you will find certain 
references that might stare you in the face that would point that that would highlight this. So the one I, I sent to Ray Foreman because he he didn't mention it in his podcast on it, but I think for me is is quite a striking one. Is why does Esther? Why does Esther have to send messengers to Mordechai outside the palace, and why can't Mordechai come in? Oh, can't come in the palace unless you're approved by the king. No. Mordechai didn't want to go. Because you can't come into the palace unless you're uh, dressed in the Uh Vursak. Right? Right? Dressed in clothes the morning. Right. Right? That's right. Neither can the Kohanim enter the Beit HaMikdash when they are in Mm -hmm. states of mourning. Right? There's this notion that mourning is antithetical to the house of the king. Right? Mm. Now, of course, there's also, you know, Esther going into the king and her life being hanging in the balance um, as she enters into the inner chambers of the king, which sounds very Yom Kippur, Kodesh HaKadoshim-like, and that the king has the power to grant life or death by extending his charvet. That sounds very godlike. I mean, the whole point is that he treats himself like a god, and his, his, sang- his king, right, his castle is his sanctum. Right. Now... Great. What does that have to do with the Parsha? Right? Now, um, so this is something Ray Foreman points out that really brings us back to the Parsha, is, um, and this actually works very well with the Midrash. The Midrash says, why did Ahasuerus throw his insane party when he did? Which is, by the way, the craziest party ever. Right? Remember, 180 days of a party for the royalty followed by a seven-day party for everybody else is insane. Right? <laughs> That's just crazy. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we've just been in yeshiva for 180 days. Do you understand how long of a party that is? Like a drunken orgy for eight, 180 days. Okay? It's good time. <laughs> Amazing. What did Chazal say the point of the party was? Uh, legitimate his kingdom. Well, Chazal actually have a very, very particular, right? Oh, some oh, of the Midrashim. Yeah, the yes, he uh, thought the 70 years were over and that this uh, meant that he would be king forever because the prophecies weren't coming true and the Jews weren't going back to the Amen and Midrash, right? In no uncertain terms, Chazal are telling you the point is that he thinks he replaces God right. and the Midrash and he only feels comfortable when he's confident that he's replaced God. So how does he inaugurate the new era? Good party. Yeah, what type of party? A seven-day party followed by a one-day party. Oh, it's like a chag. No, it's like the inauguration of the Mishkan. In Sav, you have seven days. You have the eighth day where you try to take it up a level, right? Where do you actually go into the Mikdash? And what does he do on the eighth day? Kills us. Well, no. First he tries to bring Vashti in, and then you get a reverse Shmini moment, right? Because Nadav and Avihu enter when they're not supposed to and get killed, and Vashti refuses to come in when she's called and gets killed slash banished. Right? You have a seven-day followed by eighth-day final celebration of party. Right? So he... So Ray Farman argues that, right, that following this Midrashic tradition, the Tanakh is trying to draw your attention to the fact that he really is trying to take over God and therefore, you know, imbuing, again, sanctity, I'll use sanctity in the broader sense of the word, right? But sanctity is the wrong word, divinity. Divinity is a great word in the the ancient, right? The divine right of kings, right? To give divinity to his malchut, right? And the way you do that is with a seven-day inauguration followed by the eighth-day climax, Right, which is exactly what he does, and then you get this fascinating inverted parallel where, again, where Nadav and Avihu end that process by coming in when they're not supposed to, right, and Vashti refuses to come into the inner sanctum, right, and therefore gets killed. Um, and therefore, as you sort of go through Tzav and Shmini, right, and you think of what it's like to have a godly abode in this world, you know, where there are laws and controls and we're in it for God and we're not totally losing ourselves. V'chule, Achashverosh, Purim, stands as the exact opposite of a person saying, no, I'm God, right? I am the only thing that's important. And what is the upshot of that? Instead of over and over, Kashat Sivajim, Moshe, Zot Torah Ta'olah, Zot Torah HaMincha, all the laws and procedures, what is there? Big party. Yeah, not just a party. And one of my favorite moments in the entire Megillah is laws that are non-laws. 
right? The law was everyone should drink whatever they wanted and no one should force them, right? The law was that there is no law, right? It's literally the opposite. The dot, right? The dot, the law is that everyone does. Make sure that you impose that there is no rules, that no one be coerced to do anything and people do whatever they want, right? It is the total anarchy, right? The total self-indulgence, the antithesis of everything that the Mishkan stands for. And when you move to Shmini, of course, this um, th- this works even better with another Midrash, right, which is again, a very plausible reading of Pshat, though not in Pshat, which is, what was Nadav and Aviyu sin? Uh, they were drunk. Yeah, right, because it's followed by the Isser to drink when you enter the Beit HaMikdash, right, is that their problem was that they drunk, right, that, that when they go into the Beit HaMikdash, into the Mishkan, you're supposed to be in total control of your faculties, and to drink is antithetical to that. The Purim story, which is a 180 seven day drunken whatever right obviously stands as the anti-mikdash in that sense um, okay so those are just some thoughts on you know Tzav Shmini slash Mishkan versus Ahasuerosh um, again there's a lot more that you can do with this but those are just some initial thoughts to get you thinking um, and again none of this is in shot right this is all a lot of right Chazal see behind the scenes um, and again, whether they mean this literally or not, or they just mean recognize that what, that what is doing is deifying himself and therefore driving God out of the picture, right? Which is pshat, right? That is pshat, right? The fact that Ahasuerus has deified himself, right, and has driven God out of the picture, that I think is pshat in the Megillah. That's not like a, right? The, whether he actually was using Caleb and Mikdash and consciously subverting God, that already is the Midrash. But Midrash is drawing attention to what is clearly there, and when then you look at it in contrast to the Mishkan, you do for sure see two different worldviews, um, which if nothing else is right the, the theme of the Megillah. Remember, that is the theme of the Megillah, that we have different laws than everybody else. Right? That is right, that is actually the theme of the uh, part of the theme anyways of the Megillah. Okay, so those are just some thoughts for Tzav Shemini and uh, and